Hi, I'm Dr. Aaron Brennan. I'm an assistant professor in Drexel's College of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. Welcome. Today's uh, focus is going to be on uh, targeting suspiciousness and paranoia during the isolation. Um, how do we get that? Um, how do we really target the work that we're doing in this time? Um, partly, this is a thought that that um, I had had in conversations I had with some of the teams I've been able to uh, consult with. Um, and it's also something that many teams uh, shouted out for and said, we really want to talk about suspiciousness and paranoia. Um, how, how do we stop that from blooming uh, during this time? So with that, let's get the show uh, started. Uh, the purpose of today specifically is going to be to develop some strategies to keep individuals engaged while trying to inoculate against suspiciousness and paranoia. Um, we're also going to review some of the maintaining factors of suspiciousness and paranoia because um, I think on everybody's mind is that with suspiciousness and paranoia, we want to be even sharper uh, in the interventions uh, that we're doing. Uh, the purpose today, or what's not the purpose of today, is reviewing protocols for things like medication changes. Um, as many of the people who know me, I frequently say I'm not that kind of doctor, um, or things like hospitalization. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about really thinking about um, medication and stuff like that during this time, um, but that was not going to be the focus of it. The focus is going to be how do we sort of reach through telehealth and phones um, to engage the individual uh, that we're uh, that we're trying to collaborate with and keep them moving forward. So with that, let's get this party started. Okay, so just as a reminder, I know we talked about this on Friday, thinking about what is recovery-oriented cognitive therapy and what are we talking about when we uh, when we talk about what, what I refer to oftentimes as CTR. Um, it's a fusion of cognitive therapy and the recovery uh, movement principles. Uh, cognitive therapy oftentimes has this know-how that we think about, whereas uh, recovery has these, this wonderful spirit of it to move forward. So we're really going to combine this wonderful culture and spirit with some real sort of nitty gritty know-how of what are we gonna do. As I said on Friday, um, that Beck was writing about this back in Cognitive Therapy, The Emotional Disorders, uh, when he's talking about the idea of helping the patient draw on his own problem-solving apparatus. Um, and it's a real beautiful description of the idea that, that, that recovery is within the individual all along. And CTR is an extension of CBT for psychosis. And CBT for psychosis was originally developed um, to address the positive symptoms, hallucinations and delusions, and um, really applying Beck's model of anxiety to hallucinations and delusions. So even though we're going to be privileging the negative symptoms, those problems of connection and those problems of motivation, we can still sharpen up our intervention to address uh, the CBT for psychosis, to really go after that specifically, partly because we're going to be looking at um, uh, partly because we're going to be looking at um, some of those problems being made worse because of the situation that we're in, because of some of the isolation. So when we think about the negative symptoms, the reason we want to focus in on keeping people more active, more engaged, um, there's a million ways of thinking about it. We can even say like, you know, all of our parents were probably correct, that busy hands are happy hands. Um, so we can think about how do we keep individuals uh, continue to move forward. Um, so the, um, just as a reminder, um, if you go to the website, there is, uh, the PowerPoints aren't available, but the PDF is, partly because PowerPoints sometimes come across like hard to read. So the PDFs of these will be available as well as the, um, as well as the webinar will be available. So when we're thinking about negative symptoms, the reason we want to privilege them is that when we're not engaged, when we're not doing things, uh, we're more likely, we just have more time for lots of problems, right? We have problems for distressing voices, worrying um, a lot, increased stress, and we reduce the amount of data that we're taking in. Sometimes when we think about suspicious, suspiciousness and paranoia, one of the things that we want to think about is the idea that um, individuals stop taking in data. That's one of the problems of avoidance. Avoidance makes us feel better in the short run, 
But in the long run, it maintains the problems because when you stop um, uh, engaging in the environment around you, you kind of stop taking in new data. Any opportunity to correct or change the way that you're seeing things is, is ended because you stop taking in new data. So the low motivation to engage in new things as well as not connecting with other people makes the whole situation much, much uh, more difficult. So why are we going to focus in on suspiciousness? This might be the no duh slide of our of our talk today. Um, in times of uncertainty, many people can start to become suspicious and think about not just the individuals that we serve, but we can also start thinking about um, lots of um, not just the people that we serve, but think about the people in our own lives, whether you know, you're on social media or whether you, you know, talk to your neighbor from across the street in six feet distance. Um, lots of people are becoming much more suspicious. Being suspicious is actually sort of a natural thing. Humans will always feel suspicious. Um, Dan Freeman out of Oxford University puts it beautifully. Um, every day we make hundreds and thousands of decisions to trust or not to trust people. And so suspiciousness is a natural experience that we can all have. So many of the people are becoming suspicious now, whether people are questioning the motives of, of the media, whether they're questioning the motives of the government, whether they're questioning um, how this illness came to be, how it came to be spread. Um, I think suspiciousness is all around us. So it makes sense that the individuals that we serve will likely become a little bit more suspicious as well. Physical distancing limits the amount of new data that we can take in. Whether I'm engaging in avoidance or not, the fact that really I can't go see people most of the time um, is gonna limit some of those new, that, those new data that I can bring on board. Um, additionally, the more anxious we become, the more we become defensive. So everybody that I, you know, that I know these days, at some point or another is talking about the anxiety that they're feeling, talking about their anxiety being um, more amplified in this time of uncertainty. Humans don't like uncertainty. We're not really wired for that. We prefer things to be nice and simple and, 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 um, and straightforward. And so this time of uncertainty is leading to higher amounts of anxiety for many of us, if not all of us. Um, and then isolation is only gonna amplify uh, those problems as well. We feel disconnected, um, our self-esteem can start to drop as we start wondering what's going on in the world, what's going on for us, uh, things like that. Um, so when we start thinking about, is there, you know, what is the role of things like increasing medication? This is a decision for the psychiatrists and other prescribers to make. But one, two of the things for us to be mindful of is that increased medication can, can include increased sedation and side effects that individuals who are likely to draw and jump to conclusions can include some of that information. So many individuals um, that I've worked with um, in my time Sometimes if they have an experience like akesthesia um, or extreme sedation, uh, they start trying to figure out why that is. But in this time, they're also having less connection with other people to start testing their ideas as, as readily. In fact, on Friday's workshop about telehealth, people were saying, what if somebody won't get, you know, people were asking the question, what if somebody won't get on the phone with me? If we, have, if we combine that with being more sedated and having to explain why am I having these newer anomalous or unexplained experiences, that might be a bad, um, uh, a bad combination at that point. So when we're thinking about some of the traps we can fall into when we're talking about suspiciousness and paranoia um, during the physical distancing we're being asked to do, um, one of the problems we can run into is if we take a very strong, heavy-handed reality testing approach, where we're trying to sort of check, um, is, are there thoughts about suspiciousness and paranoia worthwhile? Uh, people who have been through training in CTR know that this is not really the approach that we take frequently. Um, but in this time, I would almost encourage people to take a further step back from this reality testing approach. Um, one of the things is that it's, it's sometimes quite variably successful 
But one of the problems we can have is it can actually damage some of the rapport and the connection we have with the individual. Remember, this is the way the individual sees the world. So if we start trying to uh, argue them out of it, how many people here have ever been to uh, a holiday um, uh, dinner and a, and, and a relative uh, starts kind of spouting off about whatever their particular belief is? Let's say a, like whatever side of politics they're on, you know, is the opposite of you and they start spouting off. How many people enjoy having holiday dinner with that person? How many people's minds are changed at the end of it? I'm seeing a couple, oh, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, uh, of comments popping up on that one. So through telehealth or the phone, this difficulty is likely to be increased, right? The individual's not having as, as ready of an opportunity to connect with you, to see you, um, those abilities to quickly repair are probably going to be reduced. Also, the individual always has the real simple solution of just hanging up the phone. Um, and that's going to be an opportunity for disconnection. Um, a lot of this can could potentially set us up for reduced engagement. So we remember at the last webinar, we were talking about how do we increase people's engagement by constantly testing the reality about it or whether we believe in that, whether it's true or not true, and individuals might start to sort of pull back and just not want to engage with you and not return your phone calls, not get on the phone. So this idea of testing, what's the evidence for and against that people, the FBI might be after you or people might be messing with you or people can read your thoughts. Um, I'm really gonna encourage people to sort of step away from that. And we're gonna talk about just some, some factors that maintain this type of suspiciousness and to target those instead. Um, one of the things that we can end up with is that individuals will start trying to avoid us. And listen, I think that this is, uh, can be a normal reaction to many of us. Um, I oftentimes think about, you know, uh, at times when my mom or, you know, a spouse right. or a relative yeah. starts, getting, <laughs> starts getting on the phone um, and uh, starts challenging me about this or that. You know, it's amazing how fast her, that phone call goes to, um, goes to voicemail the next time. And so uh, the individuals will be able to do that for us as well. So really thinking about this idea of like challenging their delusion um, now might not be, I would encourage maybe thinking never but might be the best time, but now especially might not be the best time to try and uh, do that type of work. Because um, connection is going to be the whole ball game here. The more we stay connected with our individuals, the more they're calling us back, the more they're getting on the phone, uh, the better we're going to be able to serve them in this in this pretty uh, uh, bizarre time. So as people start, um, you know, this is the basic model that we've talked about that um, that we we found in in the original uh, clinical trial. As people have increased motivation, um, they start doing more in their day. Um, and they'll have less time for the hallucinations and delusions, which will make them more motivated. So a lot of what we want to do is continue to focus in on that basic protocol of what are the things I can be doing right here, right now, even if I'm uh, in the isolation. So while following the basic CTR protocol, we're going to target some of those maintaining factors of suspiciousness. And so today we're going to talk about four of them. Um, and then we are going to talk about cannabis uh, just as some ways to get around it, okay? So the four main f uh, maintaining factors, um, and this comes out of a wonderful book. Um, this is really pulling a lot from Dan Freeman's work out of Oxford. And so uh, the factors we can really target are problems with sleep, problems with worry, problems with self-esteem, um, problems with anxious avoidance, um, as well as we can think about maybe now's not the best time to smoke more cannabis. And so I'm going to go through each of these. Dan Freeman, um, where's that? Oh, there it is. Okay. So one of the, the way that we're going to be focusing in on uh, activation in this way is a real specific activation. We know about doing things together. We know about um, communication priming, just talking about positive um, ex, you know, positive things, things that uh, topics people enjoy talking about. What we're really going to focus in on um, 
with this approach is the, is the one that we call simple gifts. It's the idea of introducing a basic strategy um, as a method of showing results with the individuals. It's not about this real focus in on cognitive shift. Um, it's really about giving them something that they can hold on to uh, in the moment. Um, there's lots of techniques that we can introduce as a part of simple gifts, like stress reduction techniques, mindfulness, voice control techniques, refocusing techniques. All of these can be done through telehealth or through just the phone itself. But it's a way of sort of grabbing out and helping somebody uh, feel a little bit of uh, relief in that moment. So the good part about Simple Gift is it, um, in, a, in this recent study uh, in 2019, uh, Dan Freeman and his colleagues found these are the things that individuals want solved. All of these problems that we're talking about, these simple gifts, this is the preference of the individuals we serve. And so if we're looking at things that are going to draw people in, things that people really want, uh, we're going to find that, that the individuals really are drawn to solving these problems versus looking at other things um, and, and really kind of getting into this, the, these, these deep sort of arguments. In this way, we can actually give somebody what they're looking for. Uh, I'm going to be putting links to a lot of these um, uh, on the website um, and in the YouTube video. So the, the CTR overview, we're really talking about activation. And the way that we're going to do it here is trying to help individuals solve some of the problems um, that are bothering them the most. With that, hopefully we can continue thinking about the aspirations and moving in toward action. So I've got over, overly excited fingers. So we're going to activate the individual. Um, we're going to give them some relief. And again, these are the targets that people want. The idea here is we really want to establish during this time of separation that you guys are the people that you and your team and everybody working with the individual, that they are, um, you have the answers. There's a value to talking to you. And that's really what we're going to be focusing in on these times. So if we give somebody relief, they're going to want to keep coming back. Um, Things like sleep and worry, um, these are things that any of us will pay any amount of money to get fixed. And so let's target the, 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 the issues that people really want help with in these times. So let's start with sleep. And it might seem like a, it's, it might seem like a really, or it might seem like a no duh, right? So sleep difficulties are awful, okay? How many people on this call have had problems sleeping at some point in their life? How, <laughs> how terrible does it feel? It feels terrible, right? Uh, when you can't sleep. And so any of us, think about it, we get um, jumpier, we get nastier, we get things bother us a little bit more, people get under our skin a little bit more. Um, we even can start having like just weird experiences all the time. And so these odd experiences, uh, these sleep problems uh, can lead to more negative reasoning. Uh, people can be more susceptible to, um, to these types of sleep disturbances when we're in isolation. Think about it. You're sort of on, you know, spring break for um, weeks or months. We don't know how long this is going to last for. So the idea of, oh, maybe I should go to bed at like a normal time. Maybe I'll get up in a normal time, you know, and staying on some sort of schedule. A lot of us go, well, why? Who cares? One of the problems is once we start messing with our sleep cycle, right? Once we invert the sleep, sleep cycle, uh, we can really do some damage to um, how good our sleep is. And so what we can collaborate with our individuals around is coming up with a way um, to deal with the sleep just because of the idea of, hey, having trouble with sleep, it's terrible. Nobody likes it. Um, and in fact, when you uh, are talking to your individual, you can even say, I was, I was watching this webinar and, you know, all these people raised their hands when I said, when, when the uh, instructor asked, do you ever have trouble with sleep? So we're going to collaborate around that. We're going to be pretty, like, pretty easy going, hey, let's, let's work on the sleep because not sleeping is the worst. And so then there's two main areas that we can think of in, in the way of sleep. And I'll make uh, some of them available for you guys um, online. 
So the first is just getting simple and saying, keep us, let's keep a schedule. Let's keep a schedule and fall asleep at the same time and get up at the same time. I know it seems stupid. You don't have anywhere to go. Not much is going on these days, but let's just keep the regular sleep schedule. So that way you don't have as many problems with sleep. And again, it's not saying you're going to be suspicious because of sleep, but going, none of us feel better when we have trouble with sleep. So let's keep the sleep good. Uh, the other one is just old fashioned sleep hygiene, right? Which many of us are aware of. Um, I'm gonna try and make a, um, a handout available for sleep hygiene. I think if you Google sleep hygiene, you'll find it anywhere on the internet. But those are things like go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. Uh, don't use the bed for anything else other than sleep or sex. Um, then um, things like setting up a routine before going to bed. Um, trying to limit caffeine and nicotine before going to bed. You know, any of these ideas, the more they try, the more likely they are to be successful, right? So just going through all of them and picking out some to try. Exercise in the middle of the day, are you getting fresh air? Um, so I'll post that sleep hygiene, but it's a nice, simple, unobtrusive way of, of helping out. Um, there are some more complex sleep interventions, but for some of our individuals, some real simple shifts in their sleep habits could have a profound effect on their sleep. And then just have them keep track of it. The last part about it is um, essentially don't panic. I think one of the things that people can really get into is they get really freaked out that they're not sleeping well. And it makes sense. Uh, but listen, most of us fall asleep eventually. So don't worry about it. And listen, the more you worry about it, the more you're going to have trouble sleeping. So eventually you'll fall asleep and uh, we'll figure it out. And so just think of it more as something that you're constantly fine tuning. So that's uh, a little bit about sleep. Uh, for anybody who's posting questions, just as a quick side, um, Kat, who's been kind enough to help uh, organize all of this, uh, she is sending them to me because I know some people know I can't actually see the questions as they come up. So if you have a question that I need to stop for, uh, Kat will text it to me. Um, if not, um, at the end, I'm gonna leave some time for some questions and I'll, we'll open it up and I'll be able to see them. Avoidance and isolation, right? So uh, this oftentimes can feel like easier said than done, right? But one of the things that, that will um, uh, make it much, uh, um, continue and amplify suspiciousness and paranoia um, is uh, avoidance and isolation. The more I stay away from things, the more I try to avoid, uh, the less data I have. Uh, it also provides a lot of time for, for worrying. And we're gonna talk about the importance of, of um, and the key role of worry. The last part of it is when I'm alone and I'm isolated and I'm avoiding people, it just gives me more time for these anomalous experiences, more voices, um, more sort of feelings in my body, things like that. And finally, it also leads to a reduction in self-esteem. When you're avoiding and you're isolating and nothing feels right, you start telling yourself that you're a bad person or you know, nobody cares about you, I'm all alone. And so what we want to do is think about increased opportunities for connection, even during the isolation that we've got right now. Um, so those might be um, using social media, um, doing FaceTime, uh, in a couple sessions, we're going to be doing uh, a session on how do we run clubs and groups using telehealth. Um, any of the things that we can do to just stay connected and scheduling some of that connection in. Um, it gives the individuals um, a little bit of an opportunity for connection and even testing it out and starting to see, wow, I'm not in this alone. Other people are having the same experiences that I'm having. And so now might actually be a good time to test out some of the fears uh, that, that our individuals might have. You know, um, and so one of the questions on Friday was uh, about how do I, um, what if somebody's afraid that people are recording them? Well, listen, after, after a little bit, if we can draw somebody in and help them out with some of their problems, uh, they can start seeing maybe people are recording me, maybe people aren't, but at least I feel better when I reach out and I get to see Adam through the screen, uh, things like that. Um, we can oftentimes, um, as individuals, 
feel much more capable when we choose to become the solution versus the passive recipient of treatment. And so in this whole wild situation, uh, what, some of the things that we might try to help individuals do is think about how do you become a part of the solution? And so, uh, for example, I think I said uh, on the last webinar, my kids have been doing things like um, reading to other kids, um, reading children's books and having story hour for other kids. So our neighbor across the street, they're doing a, um, a story hour, this or not story hour, but they're doing story time with my neighbor across the street, but they're gonna have to do it through uh, FaceTime. Uh, they had uh, uh, yesterday, um, they were talking, they, they spent time with other family members uh, through the internet um, which allowed my brother and his wife to go uh, get some other stuff done. And so individuals can be the solution. Whatever their specific ability is, they might reach out and say, hey, I wanted to do a join a meetup. You know, maybe it's leading a spirituality group or a mindfulness group or talking about, you know, Magic the Gathering or whatever it is that, that really, you know, gets the individual thinking. So helping them to be the solution will help hopefully overcome some of the concerns that they uh, might have um, and the avoidance that they might have. Um, the next piece of it really revolves around this idea of worry, right? We know that there's a dose response relationship between worry and paranoia, right? So paranoia leads us to, feel, to become more worried. And the more we worry, the worse our paranoia gets, right? So it's sort of one, one makes the other worse and sort of it goes around and around and around. So, um, and it kind of makes sense. I remember the first time this was introduced to me um, by uh, um, David Kingdon uh, was working on the study where they, they check this out with um, Dan, Dan Freeman's group has done a lot of this work. And David said to me, he goes, doesn't it make sense that you would worry um, if you thought the FBI was after you and tapping you? And I went, mm, I guess so. Um, but as we worry more, our suspicions just grow. So um, I think the other part to think about is now is a time when worry is, um, we're all worrying. We're all worrying more. Um, and many of us are coming up with lots of sort of suspicious type of explanations for why everything's going the way it is why we don't have the stuff that we need. And so um, it makes sense that many of us are going to uh, worry more. For our individuals, that's gonna be particularly toxic. Um, what Dan Freeman found was that as you were able to um, impact worry in his study, um, individuals um, had let, as, as you were able to impact the worry, uh, their paranoia, um, also reduced. So there was, as he called it, a knock-on effect. So and when we think about where we're going to go, we're going to think about three main things in helping individuals. One, activity. The more that we start doing, uh, the better it's going to be. So figuring out how do we increase our activity during the day um, so that way we're more likely to have less time to worry. So what are things that you're going to do inside your house? Um, Checking with individuals. Is there a project you've been wanting to do? Is there something you've been wanting to read? You know, masterful, pleasurable social activities. What are the things that we wanted to do? Um, the next part is also, how do you help other people? How do you reach outside of yourself in this time of worry um, to do other things, right? Um, so uh, that's gonna be an important piece uh, during this time is figuring out what are things that you can do? What are the passive things you can do? What are the active things you can do, right? Um, a lot of times there are these passive ways to help people. Maybe it's sending out pictures of what you're eating. Maybe it's posting pictures of um, flowers from the first day of spring, although it just snowed here in Pennsylvania. So that was a little jarring this morning to wake up to. The last thing individuals can really start to practice is mindfulness. So helping individuals um, develop mindfulness, it just gives us um, a distance from the worry. Uh, so it is a time that, that might be difficult. So developing meetups um, as uh, if you're on a team or with, if you have a group of individuals that you're serving, 
The other thing is there's some nice apps, you know, is it the best mindfulness ever? Maybe, maybe not, but there's some really good apps that individuals can try out and they have a lot of time on their hands. So um, there are apps like Headspace, Calm, uh, there's Tactical Breather, which isn't a mindfulness app, but it's, it's a stress reduction app. So uh, I said this uh, before, um, when I introduce an individual to Headspace, um, and we might need to walk them through downloading it and things like that, and just make sure that it's on their phone. That Headspace has three options for the free part of Headspace. There's a three minute, a five minute, and a 10 minute um, version of Headspace. And this is what we want to push individuals to do. Only do the three minute version. And this is the reason why is anybody can do anything for three minutes. The other part of it is uh, many of the individuals I serve are really serious, so they don't watch any of the videos. The videos are really important. They just get some of the concepts across to them. So um, on one hand, we really want to only do the three minute version, but then we also want them to um, watch the videos and learn and try it out. If they get through all 10 sessions, you can go back and do the five minute version. If you get through all 10 sessions, go back and do the 10 minute version. And it's all of these great things that are free uh, that they can do. As they get a little bit of distance from these experiences, they're not gonna hope, it'll reduce the amount that they get dragged up into the, um, into the worry as much. Again, I'm not saying this is the perfect way to introduce somebody to mindfulness, but, um, Dr. Beck once uh, frequently said to me that perfection uh, is the enemy of good. And so right now we want to really get some nice, easy things that people can try out. There are also tons of YouTube videos on yoga and mindfulness and all these things. So there are plenty of opportunities out there. Um, the next part that we really want to focus in on um, is self-esteem. When we're alone, we're left with our own thoughts. And that can be a wonderful thing, uh, and that can be a terrible thing as well. And so when we're thinking about um, the, the lowered self-esteem, um, really have individuals start to sow the seeds now that will bloom in a week or two, depending on how long this thing's gonna go for. So what are some of the, the what are some of the things um, uh, what are some of the things that individuals can be doing right now to focus in on their self-esteem? Part of it might be um, um, focusing in on some of their successes, going through pictures. You know, there are all of these things that prime us to the times that have been good in our lives. Um, so if you've got an individual who has a ton of pictures they've been wanting to go through for a while, you know, Start with the idea of, even if you're on video, have them show some pictures and then start having them organize those pictures a little bit. And as they organize the pictures, they're picking up these photos of times when things were good, uh, times when things were, were um, uh, exciting. And so a lot of times, if you go through the pictures on your, on your, um, on your computer, you see all of these, this, these types of great things. They might sort of look around and start like listing out what are some things that have been going well? What are the things I want to accomplish next? And so really taking some time to acknowledge that. As we start priming a more positive self-esteem, uh, we're not going to be looking at all of the problems as much. We're not going to be drawn into it um, as much. Again, I know this seems to be like a theme, but we're all in it together. So figuring out ways, how can I help other people while we're doing it? Uh, so maybe if they do have to go out to the store, um, uh, seeing if there's a neighbor that needs stuff who's elderly and, and picking up some things for that neighbor and, and helping them out in that way. And reminding people, reminding the individuals that they're in it together. Everybody has to feel comfortable with their boundaries and disclosure. Um, but I also don't, I also think that there's a good balance between boundaries and disclosure and genuineness. And so I don't think it's a massive um, uh, oversharing uh, to let somebody know that uh, this is a hard time for us too, uh, that many of us can feel disconnected as well. Um, many of us can feel really anxious and really nervous. 
um, in this time as well. So uh, there was a great question that just came up about how do we uh, deal with paranoia and anxiety uh, during with restricted store hours, uh, with some of the limited supplies that are out there. Um, I think one of the, the, the ways that I've started to approach this is that I share with individuals my experience of it. And so, for example, saying, oh, you know, yesterday I went and there were no carrots in the stores. Um, but today I went and um, there were carrots, um, which is such a weird thing. But like you look around and there's stuff that's not there. You go, why are there no tortillas in, my, in, in, the, in the store at all? But then the next day they're all filled. And so um, I think part of the, the, the way of addressing the paranoia is saying you're not paranoid, it's freaky. It's really anxiety provoking to show up and there's no toilet paper. Um, and so I think sharing that, that many people are talking about it. Um, I heard on NPR uh, a person saying, please remember that some people live paycheck to paycheck. So when they get their paycheck, if that's when they can buy toilet paper, if you've taken all the toilet paper, they can't get any toilet paper. Um, and so helping people see that they're in it together. Um, and then having them provide you with the answer of why are we limited? Why do you think it's, what's good about them limiting it? What's not good about them limiting the store hours? And really having them provide some of the answers too and explain. Um, and if they don't know, that's a great time to jump on the internet together through, it, through telehealth. Um, because it isn't about um, we as the providers having the answer, it's about us developing the answer together. Remember, every time the individual gives you the answer, it's much more ingrained in them. Every time we give them the answer, it might stick, it might not stick uh, as much. Um, so again, I said we were gonna talk about cannabis uh, during it. Um, I think it's an important time to stay really factual I would also say that if you've got somebody who's been struggling with cannabis or you, smokes and doesn't smoke, uh, now is not the time to break out your best sort of reefer madness uh, lecture. It's definitely not, uh, mainly for the same reason as reality testing isn't gonna be really useful. Um, that person's probably not gonna call you back if we're talking about their cannabis use every time they call. I'm not saying it's useful for them to smoke cannabis, I'm just saying we're probably or possibly not gonna impact their cannabis use in this time. So I would say be factual, um, share that these are the facts you know, it may or may not be true for you. Um, uh, also note that this is gonna be a time when we might be using a lot more um, or might have more time on our hands. And boredom's, a lot of people smoke because they're bored. Well, listen, I've been really busy you know, me, Aaron Brennan, has been pretty busy since this whole thing started. I still am getting bored. Um, so uh, this is a really fun one. This is a, a study that Dan Freeman did um, where they took 121 people who uh, have experienced suspiciousness or, par or had experienced paranoid thoughts uh, who had also smoked uh, or used THC at least once in their life. Um, and so they randomly assigned them um, to either get THC or to get a placebo. And so the very cool thing was, um, you know, um, the, uh, the very cool thing uh, that, that Dan found was that the individuals who um, got the THC were, were significantly more likely to have paranoid thoughts um, and anomalous experiences and anxiety uh, than the people who got the placebo. Uh, my favorite part about this study, um, you know, uh, and my favorite part about this study was that um, the individuals who got placebo uh, acted high, he said. And so, uh, so it wasn't that they knew they got the placebo or they didn't get the placebo. So the people who got the placebo acted high, but were less likely to report paranoid thoughts. Uh, so again, just being collaborative going like, listen, better safe than sorry, right? Like now's not the time to, to, to poke the bear. Um, so that, that might be helpful. Um, so individuals here are becoming more paranoid because um, they, they, their families are in the house, uh, might be smoking cannabis. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think just sitting there and helping them notice, 
listen, the police aren't running out trying to bust people in their house smoking weed right now anyway. So um, just ask them, like draw down this to go, what do you think the chances are that the, that the police are coming to your house in the middle of like reduced time? And then go, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but you know, it, it might not be worth it. Um, if they want to smoke, they can, they can try, sort of try. You could also have them observe, you know, um, what are you going to do? Are, is it, you know, um, when you smoke, notice, have, do you feel more suspicious or, or have any of these things afterwards? So just have them notice um, and then go, listen, we're in it together. If you smoke and you feel more suspicious, okay, maybe we knock it off. If you smoke and you don't feel suspicious, I don't know. Maybe it's worth it. Maybe it's not worth it. It's a lot of money to be spending during the, during the isolation anyway. So another way I've explained it to some of the individuals I've served is um, that if there's a biochemical, if there's a neuro, um, neurotransmitter reason that these suspicious experiences happen, uh, they believe it's this sort of weird thing that we call dopamine. And they believe that it's too much of it sort of between the little spaces between your neurons. Um, but we know that cannabis works by increasing the, the dopamine um, in between the neurons. So essentially, you're smoking something that's increasing the neurotransmitter that we think might be making you have some more of these suspicious thoughts. So maybe it's not worth it. But again, it's all of this sort of like, we're all in it together, we're going to figure it out versus a... Um, very strong uh, message uh, to the individuals. So just I think the, the important thing that we can really help the individual start seeing is this idea that we're all in it together, right? Um, helping them understand that many of us are experiencing very similar things. Many of us are really worried. Uh, many of us are feeling lonely during this time and feeling separated. Um, and so uh, many of us are feeling isolated. Some of us are feeling, starting to feel really suspicious or even thinking like weird things. Um, I know uh, when my wife and I walk the, have, have walked a uh, dog, um, uh, every once in a while I turn to her and I say, do you ever feel like we're at the, um, do you ever feel like we're in the flashback of a zombie apocalypse movie? Right, like you're just sort of like walking, nobody's on the street. Like, I just feel like something weird's gonna happen. And we laugh and then we keep walking Bonnie a little bit faster, but then we get home. Um, many of us are having sleep problems during this time, right? This, between the stress and all that stuff, we're having some sleep problems. And some of us can even have like a dip in our self-esteem. Am I gonna be able to do this? Am I gonna be able to help the individuals that I serve? So uh, helping your, in, your individual know uh, that they really do have this horrible disease. It's called that they're human. And so we're going to get through this thing together and we're going to figure it all out together. But a lot of what they're experiencing has to do with them being human. Um, Dan Freeman wrote this great book um, and I'm going to put a link to it um, so people can find it. Uh, it's called Overcoming uh, Paranoia and Suspicious Thoughts. Um, it was written by Dan Freeman, Jason Freeman, and Phil Garrity. Uh, Dan Freeman, if people don't know his work, um, and Phil Garrity uh, are some of the great thinkers um, in paranoia and suspiciousness, um, and just really wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but at the beginning of the book and the end of the book, they say, if you think we're, this book is going to help you get rid of suspicious thoughts, I've got bad news. All humans have suspicious thoughts. And at the end of the book, he goes, so do you think we're getting rid of all the suspicious thoughts now? He goes, sorry. We're still going to have suspicious thoughts because we're all human. Uh, so, um, and so thank you. Uh, thank you again to uh, Peak. Um, and I know that uh, I think there's some people from LA County um, who are getting this out there um, and in, in Georgia as well. So um, we're all in this together. So let's keep this going. And with that, let's uh, answer, some, answer some questions. Oh, one of the questions that came up was, um, Oh, okay, uh, was about low income. Um, how do we help them manage money uh, during the crisis? Um, I think the best, uh, I found that my, uh, the way I'm successful um, in, in helping individuals uh, manage their money and stuff like that um, is just being collaborative and looking at what they've got, looking what's coming in 
um, and then listing out everything that they're, that they're spending. Uh, so for example, if I was doing this as telehealth, I might hit share and do like a whiteboard, right? And we can just, we can list out all of those, you know, um, how much are they making? I, I would probably do this in an Excel spreadsheet because I'm not that good at math. Um, but, you know, so we can talk about sort of what money do you have, what money do you have coming in? It's hard to type around the little microphone that I'm using, right? And then what are the, what are the expenses? Um, it's really hard to type around a, the microphone. Um, and then listing them out side by side, adding them all up, and then saying, where do you want to, where do you want to make, um, um, where do you want to, to, where could we make some cuts? Where we could we pull stuff in? How do you go in with other people to get more things? Uh, whether it's cutting back on your food um, and, or thinking about how do you, cutting back on the expenses that you're using for your food. Um, a lot, some individuals I've talked with, we've just gone over recipes. Listen, there's really expensive stuff you can eat and there's really, there's cheaper stuff that you can eat that still, still can be pretty tasty. Um, and so doing that. Again, as we, as we're, I'm always, I, I'm always a guy who does, I don't like to leave any crumbs on the table, uh, no pun intended. Um, so as we start maybe being a little bit more successful in managing some of the, uh, the crisis um, and the money, making sure that I learn, what does that mean about you that you're able to, that you're able to, to stretch the dollar uh, in this way, stretch some of the, the money that you're, um, that you're doing. The question, um, that was asked about what if an individual um, uh, is worried that they're gonna become symptomatic because of a contact high. Uh, this is that moment where I'm gonna go, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Um, actually, I don't think people can become, would become symptomatic because of uh, a contact high. Uh, the other thing is find out what do you wanna do while they're getting high? Being, being around high people isn't that much fun. You know, to say, what do you wanna do instead? And just figure out what are you can, you know, what other stuff uh, do you want to do? Go look at a TED talk uh, or something like that. Probably wouldn't get high unless in an enclosed space like a car. So there you go. What? So one second. There's one more question that came in. Okay, it's paranoidation that the person will get. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. So I I think that there there was a there was a the question came in is that the individual is worried. They're sort of paranoid that they're going to get a contact high. And so one of the things you might do is just have them define, be like, first of all, validate the fear. Like, I don't want to get high either in, if I'm not planning on getting high. So, you know, I think that's a fair thing to say is like nobody wants to have an experience that they don't want. And so um, it's funny, it's, this almost feels like a little bit more of like an obsession that like, oh, if I'm around it, I'm going to get high. And so... Um, uh, the thing that, that you might do instead is go um, define what would, it, how would I know if you were, how would we know if you were high and then just really define that out or how would you know, how would a person know if they had a contact high um, and then start seeing uh, what they could do instead. Um, also have them schedule uh, with, you know, have them schedule. Um, when are the times when you're going to spend time with your family? Schedule the time to go hang out with your family when they're not smoking um, and then, you know, or go off and like make pancakes for them while they're smoking or the things you could do. The other thing is talking about a little bit of assertiveness is going, Hey guys, we're in this closed space, you know, just like we would have assertiveness about managing who gets the office when saying, listen, I know you guys, absolutely. You should smoke. I'm not taking that away from you. This is the thing I don't want. And just being open with them. I bet the family, uh, hopefully some of the families will go, okay, cool. Or say, just let me know when you're going to smoke. So I'm going to go off and, and be somewhere else during that time. Okay. So cool. Everybody, please be safe. Wash your hands. Um, uh, do all the good stuff. And uh, I will see you guys Friday for families um, during the isolation. So 